Now you can just go ahead and edit or talk about it. And we'll come back and edit all this stuff out before we put it out. So okay. do I need to say anything introductory here? Uh, you can or you could just just wait until we get to a title slide. Yeah. Okay. This is literally I put this on so I had something I could get everything loaded up on. Okay. And this way if it runs if I if I end up clipping it on at the beginning it's a slide that no one's going to mind okay okay where did it jump back out <laughs> please review the cme guidelines here as noted with the review date and the cme credits available for this activity Today we're going to talk about updates on meningococcal vaccination. I am Dr. Jessica Snowden. I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician at the Children's Hospital in Omaha. My discloses are listed before you, none of which should conflict with what we're going to talk about today. Meningococcal disease remains a very serious disease in childhood. Neisserius meningitidis is a gram-negative bacteria that causes bacteremia and meningitis in children. The symptoms include fever and malaise that can progress to shock and death within just a few hours. Patients may also have a purpuric rash and meningeal signs, depending on manifestations of their disease and the time at which you see them. Even with modern medical care and antibiotics, mortality is up to 10%, with up to 50% of survivors experience serious sequelae such as limb loss, hearing loss, blindness, and the need for skin grafts. At any given time, 5-10% to of the population can be asymptomatically carrying meningococcus as part of their upper respiratory flora, and we still don't know exactly why some people are carriers of this disease and some become infected. The risk for meningococcal disease is highest in infancy, with college students and military personnel also being at increased risk. Most cases occur sporadically, although outbreaks have been reported, including frequent outbreaks in colleges and other locations with large numbers of adolescents and young adults living in close quarters. Disease incidence occurs in cycles, with periods of low activity typically preceding peaks in activity. According to unpublished CDC data, subtypes A, C, Y, and W135 caused 73% of all cases of meningococcal disease in the United States. These are the serogroups that are covered by most of the available vaccines. In 2012, it's important to note that 160 cases of approximately 500 reported cases for the whole year were caused by serogroup B in association with several outbreaks. In 2013, there were also serogroup B outbreaks in New Jersey and California on college campuses that resulted in 13 cases and one death. Serogroup B is also known to cause more disease in infants, and we'll talk specifically about the importance of these different subtypes with the vaccines. Other high-risk groups to be aware of, in addition to age, people with underlying medical conditions such as asplenia, either functional, anatomic, or surgical, uh, and terminal complement defects or other complement defects are at high risk for disease. Also, patients who are traveling to regions in which meningococcus is epidemic or hyperendemic. This particularly includes the meningitis belt in sub-Saharan Africa in the dry season and the Hajj pilgrimage to South Saudi Arabia. There are three meningococcal vaccines licensed in the United States for use in children and adults against serotype A, C, Y, and W135. As noted previously, this covers 73% of the most common serotypes reported in the United States. There's a quadrivalent meningococcal polysaccharide vaccine, usually denoted as MPSV4, that's used for patients two years and older, but it's primarily used in those over age 55. There are also two meningococcal conjugate vaccines, which are used primarily in children. These include Menactra, a product by Sanofi Pasteur, and Menvio, a product by Novartis Vaccines. These are indicated for patients ages 2 to 55 years of age, and they are interchangeable among children over age 2. Menactra is also licensed for infants as a two-dose primary series, three months apart, among children 9 through 23 months of age who are at high risk. And the Menvio product is approved down to two months of age, with four doses being administered at ages 2, 4, 6, and 12 to 15 months in high-risk populations. There is also a combination vaccine available called Menhibrix that includes the meningococcal components as well as Haemophilus influenza B components of vaccination for children 6 weeks to 18 months of age that can be used in certain circumstances. 
There are newly approved serogroup B vaccines that have just been approved in the last six months. These are called Trememba and Vexero. They were recently approved by the FDA to cover serogroup B meningococcal disease. Trememba was improved in October of 2014. It is administered to patients 10 to 25 years of age as a three-dose series. It was approved via the FDA's accelerated approval program after recent outbreaks of serogroup B infection on U.S. college campuses and was administered at Princeton and the University of California, Santa Barbara during these outbreaks. Vexero was subsequently approved in January of 2015 and is also approved for ages 10 to 25 years of age as a two-dose series. There are no routine recommendations for these vaccines at this time as they are relatively newly approved, but they may be used in outbreaks and other special circumstances. The ACAP is continuing to review recommendations for vaccines to be updated yearly and may incorporate these vaccines in future schedules, but we have yet to see this. So who gets meningococcal vaccine? Currently, we recommend it universally at ages 11 to 12 years of age, with a booster to be given five years later. The immunity to this vaccine appears to wane over three to five years, so the booster dose provides added protection to get adolescents through this highest risk period of 11 years through 21 years, remembering that we have big outbreaks in high school students and early college age in this population. All previously unvaccinated adolescents age 13 through 18 years should receive a vaccine. You only need one dose if you're otherwise healthy and were vaccinated at 16 years or older. Again, remembering that this vaccine gives you three to five years of coverage and we want to get them through early college age. So if your patient comes in at 16, they can get just one dose. If they're younger than that, you want to give them two doses spaced three to five years apart. All previously unvaccinated first-year college students who come in at 19 to 21 years of age who are or will be living in a residence hall or going off to a military where they may be in crowded conditions or any similar condition to that, you want to make sure you give them at least one dose. They will only need one dose if they're otherwise healthy and have been vaccinated at 16 years of age or older. Younger children at high risk for disease should also be vaccinated. If they are going to travel to or live in the African meningitis belt, they have a complement deficiency, we start this at nine months of age. If they have asplenia starting at age two after the Prevnar series is complete. The important thing about starting the asplenia patients at age two is that it's more important for them to finish their meningococcal, excuse me, their pneumococcal vaccine series, um, as pneumococcus is a more common and serious disease in this population. And the pneumococcal and meningococcal vaccines appear to interfere with each other immunologically. So you want to make sure that you complete their PCV13 first and then give the meningococcal vaccine, particularly if you're going to use the Menactra product. Minveo and Minhibrix do not appear to have this issue and can be given with PCV13. So it depends on what product you're going to have available in your office. We may administer it to younger children in a community or institutional outbreak. If you're going to administer to younger children, um, you will want to make sure that you follow the specific dosing for each specific product, as we mentioned a couple of slides ago. If you have a younger patient who is at high risk, you want to give them two prim a two-dose primary series two months apart if they're in this high-risk group. You also want to make sure that adolescents with HIV get a two-dose primary series. Children who get vaccinated at nine months to six years of age need to get revaccinated re three years later and then at five-year intervals so long as they remain at risk. So in the case of a patient with asplenia, they are presumed to remain at risk indefinitely, whereas if your patient was vaccinated because they were living in the African meningitis belt but then returned from that area, they may not need indefinite vaccination. So you're going to evaluate this on a case-by-case -case basis. Who else gets the meningococcal vaccine? HIV patients may, depending on their circumstance. HIV does not necessarily place a patient at higher risk from meningococcal disease. Current recommendations for vaccination with two doses administered eight weeks apart are for HIV-positive adolescents age 11 through 18 years who, like other adolescents, are recommended for routine meningococcal vaccination, HIV-positive people age 2 through 55 years who are at prolonged increased risk for exposure to meningococcal disease, for example, who are travelers to or residents of countries where high disease is hyperendemic, or microbiologists who routinely work with Neisseria meningitidis, and then any HIV-positive adult who wishes to be vaccinated against meningococcus should be. As we discussed earlier, military recruits are generally vaccinated against meningococcal disease, and then any person who works as a microbiologist with routine exposure to isolates of Neisseria meningitidis should be vaccinated. 
side effects and precautions. You can see brief fainting spells and related symptoms such as jerking or seizure-like movements following vaccination. This typically happens with adolescents and they can result in falls or injuries. So make sure you have your patient sitting or lying down for about 15 minutes after getting the shot as this can help prevent these injuries. Other side effects include injection site pain and redness or fever. Allergic reactions are rare but may occur. A history of allergic reaction to a vaccine component is a contraindication to vaccination. Guillain-Barre syndrome is no longer listed as a precaution for meningococcal conjugate vaccines. Menactra previously listed this as a precaution, although it was never listed for Minveo or Minhibrix. Findings from the two studies that examined more than 2 million doses of Menactra given since 2005 showed no evidence of an increased risk of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Consequently, the ACIP recommended in 2010 to remove the precaution for the use of Menactra in people with a history of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Meningococcal vaccine has been relatively successful. Adolescent meningococcal vaccine coverage has increased from 10% in 2006 to 70% in 2011. A study in New York showed that co-administration of the meningococcal vaccine with the Tdap booster recommended at this age significantly increased uptake of this vaccine, which is aiding in our meningococcal vaccine coverage. In 2009 to 2010, there was a decrease in serogroup C and Y meningococcal disease among adolescents but not other groups, suggesting that this is individual immunity attributable to the vaccine, which covers these serotypes, but not herd immunity. There was no change in serogroup B incidence. The vaccine effectiveness has been estimated at 80 to 85 percent, with some disease breakthrough recorded, and it does appear to wane over time, which factors into our boosting recommendations every three to five years. It is important to note that meningococcal disease was decreasing for reasons unknown prior to introduction of the vaccine. However, the vaccine has helped further decrease that disease incidence. So in summary, meningococcal conjugate vaccines should be included with routine vaccination of adolescents at 11 to 12 years of age with multiple chances to catch up those who may have missed it so that we can protect them during this high-risk period. Administering the Tdap vaccine along with meningococcal vaccine and HPV together may help increase the uptake of all three vaccines and protection in this high-risk population. Booster dosing at age 16 is important to provide protection through the high-risk late adolescent early college years. Patients with complement deficiency or asplenia are at particularly high risk of disease and will need special dosing timelines, as we discussed here. Resources for more information always include the CDC's vaccine pages as well as the ACIP. In addition, if you have travel-related questions or concerns, the Yellow Book link, which I've showed here for the CDC, is very helpful, which has country and disease-specific recommendations. As always, you can call our office in infectious disease to help with any of these issues. For more information for patients or offices, please check out the Immunization Action Coalition at immunize.org. Yeah, let's go ahead and make them separate files. Okay. Oh, it turns out I did meningococcus so we can take it out. Okay. Okay, we can close this one. Now let's see, copy that. Okay, and that's the one up there. And that's the recordings, so I'm going to turn it off. 